And in considering how and whether governments might talk to Hamas or Hezbollah or the Taliban, I think we raised across in our, in our working group a range of factors that also come to bear on this question. As I said, what should the balance be between military efforts or what we might call hard power and the readiness to engage in soft power uh, solutions and efforts to engage in dialogue? It's important, I think, to, uh, and I think there's widespread agreement on this, to consider the nature of the terrorist leadership faced and what are the opportunity structures that that terrorist leadership face and think about the way in which a readiness to engage in talks might um, affect that opportunity structure. It's all very well asking whether we should talk to Hamas or the t Taliban, but an equally, equally crucial question, uh, certainly as we saw in the working group, was whether or not they will talk to us. I think it should be fair to say there was a fair degree of pessimism, certainly in relation to the, this in Afghanistan with regards to the senior Taliban leadership, of whether they would talk to us in relation to any uh, settlement that we would consider the West, NATO, and the Americans would consider uh, acceptable. They believe that they are winning, and therefore, why stop now? All of which raises another uh, sort of big question to consider. What does a political solution look like? What is, in any of these conflicts, a legitimate political settlement, and who sets this? And what is the relationship between that settlement and a wider democratic context? And how does that relate to the political objectives of the group in question? And is it possible to imagine the reconciling of uh, terrorist group objectives and what uh, we or our allies might consider to be reasonable solutions to a, uh, a conflict? Are there areas of mutual interest? Or are there red lines that cannot be crossed? Uh, and what impact does this have? And is it possible to achieve and activate more pr pragmatic strands to go back again to the kind of character of the terrorist uh, organizations we face? Are there pragmatic elements within those entities that might indeed be engaged on certain issues? Um, as, as one of our participants put it, is it possible to analyze the empirics of, of pragmatism within a, within a given conflict? and facilitate those aspects, pushing and pulling an organization towards ending its campaign of violence? Um, and how is a readiness to engage in talks likely to affect um, the, the path towards such a solution? Um, but I think I'll, I'll close there. And as I say, those are the sort of main outlines, broad questions that I think we were asking in our working group as a, as a way of setting up further lines of debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, for getting the ball rolling. Um, obviously, we've heard some tentative thoughts on negotiations with the Taliban, so I think that sets us up nicely for the next working group uh, on Afghanistan and Pakistan, what way forward. That group was chaired by Colonel John Wood. Uh, again, uh, Colonel Wood is the director for Afghanistan and Pakistan coordination at the NISA Center um, at, the, at, at the National <coughs> Defence University, our partners for the conference. Uh, prior to joining the NISA Centre, Colonel Wood was the Senior Re Director for Afghanistan at the National Security Council under both the Bush and Obama administrations briefly, and he served 28 years in the US Army. So if I could hand over to you, Colonel Wood. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I was struck by a number of the similar questions and issues that, that came up in the, in the previous panel. And, um, I, I note in particular that you left them as questions and you didn't provide us a solution, so uh, it's noted. Uh, we uh, we uh, tackled uh, the way forward in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and, and as a, a way to frame that very uh, complex set of, of challenges, we broke it into the three sessions, and, and each one of those sessions teed up with a particular question. The first session we focused on, where are we going? Um, and we tried to ask the question, is there a common vision and are there common objectives? And we'll get to that in just a moment. The second session we focused on, uh, well, where are we right now? Is there a common assessment about the status of, of the situation on both sides of the border? And then the third question, uh, based on the answers that we might have, the conclusions we may have come to from the first two, are, are how do we go forward? How, how do we get there? You know, where are we going? Where are we now? How do we get there? Um, and despite the, the uh, large number of strategic reviews and strategy reviews and policy relooks and uh, across uh, both the, the Bush and Obama administrations and ISAF and NATO and U.S. Central Command, et cetera, um, we still feel strongly that there is not a common vision 
on what the, uh, the end state or what one of my colleagues has called the steady state outcome is for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And what further complicates this, uh, this lack of common vision um, is that, that you, you receive radically different visions from the various stakeholders that are, that are involved. And so we tried to debate for a little while, well, what, what would the Pakistanis want as a steady state outcome? What would the Afghans want as a steady state outcome? And we immediately found ourselves debating which Afghans, which Pakistanis, what elements of society, which major stakeholders from what vantage point. And what we concluded was that while there is a, uh, a hard time coming to grips with the Western vision of steady state outcomes in Afghanistan and Pakistan, there is an equally uh, difficult and competing set of visions of what the people that actually live in the two countries would like to see as the outcome. And so, um, so while we can refer to these benchmarks or lodestone phrases, disrupt, dismantle, defeat al-Qaeda, protect the United States and our allies from, uh, from attacks that emanate from, from the region, um, when you get uh, down to the level of determining what those objectives so succinctly stated require in terms of implementation, we find that, that the, uh, we concluded that, that there is not a really clear, succinct, well understood goal because, <clears throat> because the manner of implementation to get to those broad overarching targets uh, leaves such great latitude that we find ourselves continually De debating the issues of the ways and the means to get to those objectives rather than a common vision uh, in, in those two regards that match the common vision of defeating Al-Qaeda even. Um, we, uh, we had <clears throat> considerable debate about how much influence the Afghan uh, population, the Afghan government, or the Pakistani government should actually have over objectives and goals that the West would like to see implemented in, in the country, uh, in the two countries. In fact, the question was if we have a short timeline and we have sizable resources going in from the West, just how much uh, should the Afghans, uh, the Afghan government or the Pakistani government actually be in the driver's seat? Uh, considerable debate within the working group uh, and it was left as an open question. Uh, with the caveat being that, that there is this overriding sense that the, that the clock is ticking. Uh, in particular, the, the, the will of the West to remain engaged. And that's pre perhaps best personified uh, or demonstrated by the, the, the President's statements regarding July 2011 and all of the continuing consternation about what that date really means. Uh, and even this week, with uh, General Petraeus' hearings yesterday uh, with the uh, unfortunate circumstances regarding General McChrystal last week, we, we continue now to see, uh, low these many months after the December speech issued by the President, continued debate about what this July date actually means. So further, further emphasis that, uh, that we, we concluded that there is not yet a full common understanding and a shared common vision. Secondly, where, where are we now? Um, th that too depended, your answer depended on, on whose faction or whose vantage point you were representing. Um, we got to the point of debating whether or not the, the greatest threat or challenge inside of Afghanistan, for example, was the Taliban and the insurgency itself, or was it really the state of the Afghan government? Um, or was criminality the greatest threat? Or was uh, foreign meddling the greatest threat, to find that any way you want to. But, but even when we try to sit as a group who have looked at this, these issues for a considerable period of time, um, we did not have a single uh, coherent answer on how to define, quote, the enemy. Um, and so that leads us then to our third topic, which is how do we get there? Uh, and as you can probably guess, uh, since I've sort of portrayed that we didn't know where we were going and we kind of don't know where we are, the how do we get there remains a considerable problem uh, and, a, and a big challenge. 